Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America webinar. The topic for today's webinar is how to help depressed and suicidal teenagers. I'm Suma Chand. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry. I'm a psychologist specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy, and I work at the St. Louis University School of Medicine. Now, I'm a member of the ADAA Public Education Committee, which has produced a series of monthly webinars. Now, before the presentation starts, I'd like to give you some of the guidelines, the technical guidelines regarding the webinar. On the right side of your screen, you should see a Q&A panel. There's a little field at the bottom of that panel. And when you click in it, you can type in a question. Then either hit your Enter key or click the icon. You should be listening to this webinar through your computer speakers. You do not need a telephone connection. If you've dialed in, please hang up and turn up your computer speakers. We'll be answering your questions at the end of the presentation, but you can ask your questions at any time. Rather, you can type in your questions at any time, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Other participants cannot see your questions, so do feel free to type in your questions. Now, we may not have time to get to your individual questions, so we apologize if that is the case in advance. Now, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, or ADAA. It was started in 1979, and today it is a leading nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing awareness and education about anxiety disorders, depression, obsessive-compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and related illnesses. ADAA's mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of these disorders through education, practice, and research. ADAA fights to end stigma by promoting the message that they're real, they're serious, and treatable. Please visit the ADA website. That's www.adaa.org which includes a find a therapist, a searchable database of treatment providers, as well as free educational information and resources, self-tests, self-help groups, clinical trials, and a lot more. You can support ADA's efforts, such as this webinar series, by making a charitable contribution on the ADA website. We are recording this webinar, so it will be available on the ADA website at a later date. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Alec Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is an eminent researcher and clinician known nationally and internationally for his expertise in the area of adolescent depression and suicidology. He's a co-founder and clinical director of Cognitive and Behavioral Consultants of Westchester at, and uh, Manhattan. He's also clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Now let me turn it over to Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chan, and thanks to ADAA for the invitation uh, for my uh, a webinar this evening, and good evening, everyone. Um, I hope the audio is uh, suitable and that everyone can hear me loud and clear, and certainly if there's a problem, uh, please let us know. So uh, as you heard, tonight's topic is on how to help depressed and suicidal teenagers. And without further ado, I wanted to kind of just dive right in and uh, give the presentation, and I look forward to taking some, some questions. So the outline for my presentation is first to just define the problems, talk about how we conceptualize um, the, the emotion dysregulation among depressed and suicidal youth, give you a very brief overview about what are some of the evidence-based therapies, and then spend a bit of more time talking about the rationale for DBT with adolescents in clinical settings and schools who, who have this presentation. Okay. Uh, now, again, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on these statistics, but suffice it to say there are a large number of adolescents who really suffer from uh, depression and depressive episodes that can last 
you know, for many, many months at a time, if, if even with a single episode, let alone recurrent episodes. So we, the, the functional impairment from depression, as many of you know, is significant. The, the, the problem of suicide in youth is also serious, and, and depending on the year of the study, you have somewhere between 16, 18, even 19 percent of, of, of adolescents in, in school settings surveyed nationwide report having seriously considered suicide in the past year. 13 percent of those had made a, a plan on how to commit suicide. 8 percent actually attempted suicide. And you know, just to give you a, a round number of completed suicides in this country, there's, a, there's upwards of 5,000 youth. Um, I guess under the age of 24 who, who will take their own lives every year. So it's a serious problem. And then we add the other problem of non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors, which in my opinion have become the coping strategy of the 21st century. Kim Gratz, a colleague, has defined NSSI as the deliberate direct destruction or alteration of body tissue without conscious suicidal intent but resulting in injury severe enough for tissue damage to occur. So some kids who are depressed uh, also have suicidality. Some kids who are depressed engage in NSSI, and some uh, kids who are depressed have both NSSI and suicidal behavior. The most common methods, of course, of NSSI include um, cutting, burning, reopening up scabs and wounds. The prevalence rates of this, pro of this behavior is, are off the charts, in my opinion. In pre-adolescent community samples, 7%. Then you look at community studies with teenagers, some studies show anywhere from 14 to 28 percent in the United States, and in a study in Europe, about 35 percent. So these kids are engaging in this behavior at, at rates that are seemingly astronomical. In clinical samples, if you look at outpatient, inpatient settings, you're looking at youth 20 to 60 percent. Um, typical age of onset of NSSI is middle school. Um, and then, you know, it used to be considered a female problem. Girls were doing this or women were doing this. But if you look at the research, there's no consistent uh, data to suggest that, uh, that, that boys are, I'm sorry, boys are doing it at equal rates as, as much as girls are. Ethnically and socioeconomically, no difference. Now, why are kids doing this? The most common explanations in years past had to do with uh, NSSI, had to do with uh, kids doing this for attention and trying to let people know that they're in some form of pain, some communication function. And while that might be true for some, uh, and some other explanations include self-punishment, the preeminent and most common explanation these days for why kids engage in this behavior has a lot to do with emotion regulation. Uh, and this is important as we start to conceptualize some of the behavioral problems of, these, of the youth that we're talking about. The most common reason for NSSI is emotion regulation among adolescents, to reduce oftentimes or suppress negative affect. By cutting yourself or burning yourself, you get relief. Relief is likely to be reinforcing, and you're more likely to do it again. There are some kids who, you know, if you're, if you're highly anxious, highly ashamed, highly angry, and you engage in this behavior, it works. At quickly reducing some of the intense negative affect. For others who are numb and kind of uh, subdued, sometimes this upregulates kids who are dissociating and so forth. Um, how this works in, in a brief uh, slide, and this is useful in terms of my, my conceptualization of some of these kids. Let's say you have a teenager who has a, a relationship breakup. Uh, teenager feels anxious, uh, sad, lonely, hurt. And those, for some youth, very intolerable, aversive emotional states. And the way they cope with it is to escape from it through thinking about suicide, through engaging in self-harm, maybe even making a suicide attempt, using drugs or alcohol, binging and purging, and so forth. So the very problematic behaviors that land many of the youth that we talk about in clinical settings um, into these offices has a lot to do with their difficulty tolerating negative affect. Because once they engage in these behaviors, they get relief temporarily from the emotional pain. And that is the uh, idea of negative reinforcement. If you get into your car or automobile after this uh, uh, webinar and you hear the ringing, aversive sound of the dinging sound in your car, beep, 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 
you're automatically now well-trained to put on your seatbelt to get relief from that aversive stimulus. Similarly, the kids are doing the same. They learn it in a slightly different fashion, but they realize they, they recognize they get relief. So this is useful because we need to figure out how to intervene, not only uh, on the tolerating distress so they don't hurt themselves or binge or purge or use drugs or alcohol, but also how can they, we move the treatment over time into helping them experience negative emotions without having to avoid or escape. So suicide and non-suicidal self-injury are two of a cluster of high-risk behaviors. Many of the kids that we see often have uh, you know, school-refusing behaviors or sexual risk behaviors, substance use behaviors, aggressive and violent behaviors, as I mentioned, disordered eating. Many of the, the depressed and suicidal youth that I see often suffer from disordered sleep. And for many years, I kind of minimized the significance of that, but in a recent publication that my colleagues Ellie McGlinchey and myself and some others published in the Journal of Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior, we found that a lot of the adolescents who were depressed uh, and who had uh, suicidal behavior was exacerbated by the impairment in sleep. And uh, so was non-suicidal self-injury increased as a result, which suggests to me and to my colleagues that we need to target sleep more aggressively as that is a huge vulnerability for depressed youth to have more extreme and dysregulated behaviors. So what are, the, what are the treatments out there for depressed and suicidal teenagers? Well, certainly for many years we've, we've known about SSRIs and pharmacotherapy, and for some youth that may be sufficient. And for many families that we see, they want a, uh, a quick fix and, a, and relatively less expensive if you have insurance coverage for for pills, and so they might try meds alone. Uh, certainly that's not my first recommendation for mild to moderate depressed youth, and I'd rather try some psychosocial interventions, not only because I'm a psychologist, but because I also believe that learning some coping strategies earlier in life will help them later in life, and they don't have to feel like the only way to cope with depression is by taking pills. But for some who have moderate to severe depression, there's research that suggests um, in the TADS study years ago that a combination of Prozac and CBT was quite effective at helping depressed adolescents. Um, so there's a whole host of CBT interventions for depressed youth. There's uh, research by Laura Musson and colleagues on interpersonal psychotherapy. Um, this slide, I sorry, there's a typo. This is attachment-based family therapy by Guy Diamond and his colleagues, and and then. But I guess what I wanted to highlight is there is not a significant amount of research on depressed and suicidal youth combined. A lot of the prior treatment trials excluded suicidal youth from their research. DBT, however, is a treatment that I've been actively involved with over the last 25 years, and that has to do with treating suicidal youth, many of whom are depressed. And uh, it comes from... Uh, the treatment developer, originally Marshall Linehan, worked with adults who were suicidal, self-injurious, and who presented with borderline personality disorder, many of whom had, 90% of whom had a depression diagnosis as well. And she realized that combining the cognitive behavioral change strategies with a host of acceptance strategies that she took from her Eastern meditation practices and Western contemplative practices, and blending the two together was a critical ingredient to engaging and retaining and treating these multi-problem presentations. And so this, this slide basically highlights the need to both communicate to our patients and clients that on the one hand, from an acceptance standpoint, they're doing the very best they can in this moment. We have to believe it because of the suffering that they're experiencing and exhibiting. No one in their right mind would want to live a life this way. So they're doing the best they can in this moment on the right side, and at the very same time, they need to do better, try harder, and be more motivated to change and learn new skills and coping strategies. And that brings us to this dialectical uh, approach. So back in 95, um, we, we based our adaptation of DBT for adolescents on Linehan's in original inclusion criteria that I just mentioned. But over the past 20-something years, the inclusion criteria has broadened for patient populations and settings. Um, and uh, my colleague Lori Ritchell and I uh, published a, a chapter a couple of years ago talking about the transdiagnostic 
applications of DBT with teens. Because it is re it's really the exception rather than the rule to have a singular psychiatric disorder among youth. That comorbidity, if you will, multiple disorders coexisting is more the rule uh, rather than the exception. So many of the kids that we see who have depression have coexisting problems, as I mentioned earlier, with either substance problems, anxiety problems, um, eat disordered eating, sleep, and so forth. So just getting back to this notion of dialectics, I, I guess I highlighted it a moment ago, but we're really trying to help teenagers and families get away from the depressogenic notion of I'm either good or I'm bad, I'm either right or I'm wrong, and helping them recognize there are multiple truths that can go coexist at the same time. Like I said, doing the best I can, I'm doing the best I can, and I need to do better. I can be both serious and silly. I can be working hard and playful, et cetera. And I think when you get depressed, you get into very much non-dialectical thinking, very black and white. And this notion of dialectics opens the idea of having multiple truths that sometimes seem are seemingly opposite but can coexist at the same time and find a new truth, if you will. So why DBT for teenagers? Well, certainly the data that I'm about to show you briefly is compelling for depressed and suicidal teenagers. The theory that I'll briefly mention, I think offers a compassionate explanation of the etiology and maintenance of a lot of the dis emotional dysregulation that our, our kids, their families, and professionals, that we can better understand the theory, uh, uh, their problems through this theory that actually informs the treatment targets. And DBT is very skills-based and helps us recognize the notion that these skills deficits are, are real and that we need to give them new tools that they can practice, rehearse, and then generalize. And lastly, personally, I find the multimodal nature of DBT uh, preferable because we have various entry points to help these kids individually through skills training, family involvement, and intercession coaching. That means 24-7, the DBT therapist is available to their teenage client to help them cope with the problem before they act impulsively and make their problem already worse. So we, uh, we offer uh, between session coaching, which is, I think, a very important uh, concept in DBT. So as I mentioned, emotion dysregulation uh, for many of these kids is really the central problem, whether it be emotional ability, just having steady negative emotional states that they have trouble regulating, difficulty with anger. Many of these kids have interpersonal difficulties that result when they're depressed and suicidal. They're often withdrawn, uh, having difficulty maintaining relationships. Um, as I mentioned, behaviorally dysregulated with suicidality and non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, as well as sometimes other impulsive behaviors. You know, when you're, when you're in the emotional sea of discontrol, your sense of self and identity sometimes is in, adversely impacted. And you're kind of, what are my goals and values are really kind of lost at sea because you're, you know, the individual suffering like this is just trying to stay afloat. There's often a concurrent sense of emptiness. And then many of these depressed and suicidal youth are cognitively dysregulated. As I mentioned, I'm sorry, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a tendency to kind of get very black and white in their thinking, all or nothing thinking. But sometimes with some of our kids, it can even go more extremely into paranoia and even dissociation. So I break this down into these five problem areas for the depressed teenagers and their families. And I talk about how when you're struggling with this level of depression, anxiety, and even suicidality, you, you, you get very tunnel vision into your own emotional pain and suffering. And you get mentally hijacked, if you will. You know, lamenting the past, feeling like a failure of the things that have happened in the past, or sometimes worried uh, and preoccupied with the future, but the mental camera lens is very rarely, when you're suffering like this, in this present moment. So as I'm talking to you right now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping, as I'm hoping that you guys are focused on what I'm saying, but if you were struggling with depression and anxiety and so forth, your mind will be taken elsewhere. And so part of what we teach in DBT is mindfulness skills to bring their mental attention and focus to this present moment. And you can see how this would be to learn the behavioral skills, like I said, Linehan drew, drew from her 
Eastern meditation practices of Zen and converted this into behavioral skills and how to be in this present moment, how to be aware of what you're thinking and feeling. And when you do get distracted, and let's be clear, we all do, how do you bring yourself back to this moment with non-judgmentally and with compassion? So there's a lot of focus on mindfulness training to help with awareness and focus and clarity about goals. For many of the kids who are prone to act impulsively, to either hurt themselves, become suicidal or self-injurious, we're going to teach a host of crisis survival skills or distress tolerance skills but how to soothe themselves and distract themselves uh, and, and work on radically accepting some of the very difficult things that have happened in their lives, whether it be a divorce of their parents, uh, a, 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 a loss of a loved one or a pet, um, having a chronic medical illness or even psychiatric disorder or learning disability, and how do you become to work on acceptance of that? So that's an important segment. And then, of course, the all-important emotion regulation skills on, on – better regulating their emotional dysregulation. And when you're depressed and suicidal uh, and, and self-focused uh, on your pain, it's, your interpersonal effectiveness skills may be uh, impacted adversely, and so we're going to review more interpersonal effectiveness skills. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes when teenagers are, are depressed and suicidal, not only do they themselves become non-dialectical in their thinking, um, bad, um, uh, I'm a terrible student, I'm a bad son, they oftentimes get polarized with their parents who are sometimes lost as to how to effectively cross the, the, the cavern over the, you know, the Grand Canyon, if you will. How do you bridge uh, one teenager says on one side, uh, this is how it has to be, and the parents are saying no contraire, this is how we see it, and they get extremely polarized. And so we teach the teenagers and families how to think and act more dialectically, how to more effectively validate the other's perspective. Validation, of course, doesn't mean agreement. It just means acknowledging that my teenager or my parent is feeling a certain way, and, uh, and, and I can at least honor that. And then, of course, we want to help the parents figure out how to more effectively manage the behaviors of these kids and positively reinforce the desired behaviors. Uh, in their kids, because when you're depressed and suicidal, uh, a lot of uh, impairment takes place, and when they're trying to rebuild their lives and come out of their depression and get back on track, we need to behaviorally shape uh, things with positive reinforcement and baby steps. And so those are called walking the middle path skills that we have uh, developed. Okay, let me just move on to the next slide. So this is just a slide talking about our skills training group where we teach this curriculum uh, in 24 weeks in an outpatient setting, uh, and we invite teenagers and parents to attend our multifamily group to learn this curriculum together. It's not a process group. It's actually a skills course and life skills where they get assigned homework. Uh, we each start each group starting with mindfulness practice, and then they learn these, these tools and go out and practice, and we give them feedback on how their homework goes and teach them new skills over 24 weeks. So just so people are clear, for those new to DBT, it's a multimodal treatment where we're teaching that curriculum in a multifamily format, two-hour groups. We have individual, weekly individual therapy where the DBT therapist is having the teenager keep a diary card that tracks a variety of, of uh, urges, including self-harm ur or suicidal urges, uh, uh, tracks uh, other target behaviors, including getting them behaviorally activated and engaging and hopefully in pleasant activities and mastery building activities, tracking their sleep, tracking their whether they're using drugs or alcohol, if that's a target, and then a host of emotions. I want the kids to be more mindful of when they're feeling more depressed, even feeling more happy or content, when they're feeling more anxious. And I want them to begin to see the relationship between what emotions they're experiencing and how that relates to a, a behavioral action urges. I have the urge to overdose. I have the urge to hurt myself. And on the bottom of the diary card is a whole is the 33 skills that we're teaching them in DBT. So I can see a week at a glance if they're feeling uh, depressed and having self-harm urges, are they able to use some of the very skills that we're teaching them and have them track their use of those skills throughout the week? So it's a very important uh, document that they're tracking things, and then we do 
behavioral chain analyses to help understand what is the function of certain behaviors and what are the, what are the solutions that we can come up with if they're going down a maladaptive pathway, what, what replacement strategies can we give them to cope more effectively? So that's a big part of the, of the DBT is the individual therapy. As I mentioned before, we're going to offer coaching to our teenagers so that in between sessions, if they're in distress and they can't mindfully recall how to cope effectively, I certainly want them to try whatever skills they have first, and if they don't work, the last thing I want to have happen is them hurt themselves and then I hear about it at the next session. So I tell them very clearly, this is part of the DBT therapy. If you're feeling suicidal and you are having urges that you cannot resist, you must try some skills and if those don't work, I want you to call me for coaching before you act on the problem. Don't bother calling me afterwards, I say, because that is nothing I can, you've already decided on how to solve your problem. And a lot of times suicide attempts are, are really a, a maladaptive way of solving a problem. And I'm trying to teach them more adaptive ways in the moment. And I think sometimes we rush to p throw people in an emergency room or a hospital if they're thinking about suicide. And, uh, and, so, and I, I, there's no evidence to suggest that that's going to reduce suicidal behavior. And in fact, my argument from a DBT perspective is if we can have them feeling suicidal and then reach out for coaching, and use new adaptive behavioral skills in the DBT curriculum and manage the emotions without, you know, acting on it, this is, the, this is how they build mastery, you know, where, where, where the rubber meets the road. If we just remove them every time they start thinking about it, they don't have practice opportunities to build this mastery. So the coaching in between sessions, in my opinion, is critical, both in an outpatient setting and we also in schools encourage the kids to access coaching from their the uh, school counselors and therapists in real time as much as possible. There will be some family therapy, uh, PRN means as needed, and then there's a weekly therapist consultation meeting <clears throat> where the therapists gather and, and consult to one another about how to best manage our depressed and suicidal clientele and make sure that we're delivering it with, to adherence and, and not getting too imbalanced, either too change-oriented or to acceptance oriented. So that's the first phase of treatment. If the, if the teenager makes it through there, which they usually do, and graduate from the uh, multifamily group, then they're eligible for the graduate group, which in my opinion is really, has been a clinical highlight of my career, which is to see these graduates uh, now consult to one another and review skills and be their kind of peer therapists and validating each other, encouraging each other, and making sure they're using skills and that really helps with the generalization process. Real quick, I, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just I feel like there's a lot of things out there in the world that are not necessarily evidence-based. So I want to show you a study that I was, uh, had the privilege of being involved with, uh, with Lars Mellum and my colleagues in Norway that we published a couple of years ago. And basically it was just DBT, a 16-week trial of DBT for adolescents compared to enhanced usual care. And the, and the take-home message here is that the kids who got DBT had significantly stronger reductions in the number of self-harm episodes, decline in suicidal ideation, stronger reductions in interviewer-rated depressive symptoms, hopelessness, and even borderline symptoms after 16 weeks. So it was, it was a, a compelling randomized study. And then a year, one year later, which is I'm happy to report that there, while there were no completed suicides in either group, the folks who had DBT had significantly uh, greater improvement in a reduction of self-harm episodes compared to the enhanced usual care group. And this was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry a few months ago. So I just want to uh, take a couple of minutes to talk about my, uh, my experience over the years I mentioned in outpatient DBT and, and if working downstream, if you will, where kids are showing up, you know, in residential treatment and inpatient services with severe suicide attempts and severe depression. And it occurred to me, you know, 10 plus years ago and my colleague Jim Mazza, whether we could work further upstream and kind of bring this DBT model into schools uh, for those who are already showing difficulties in emotional dysregulation, depression, self-harm, suicidality. And then if you see further upstream where it says steps A, that's, that's the idea of, of making this a life skills curriculum that could be universally administered. And 
very briefly, there's, there's two types of DBT in schools. One is the, this kind of identified, targeted, selected intervention for those who are showing difficulties in a comprehensive DBT model. And then the other one is this universal intervention that uh, has begun to be used in classroom settings. And in places like Stanford, Connecticut, the high school is offering a course for credit where you can spend a semester learning these skills and being evaluated not on uh, on your test, on your knowledge of skills, and but also whether you're doing your homework and practicing. And in my dream of dreams, having worked with depressed and suicidal kids for many, many years now, if we could bring this into late elementary and middle school and give these young people the life skills that they're, they're learning English and social studies and math, how about we give them life skills that can help with mindfulness, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance? I think we're going to have less outpatient and ER work to do. Is my is my sense. Um, very briefly, um, the the steps a protocol is is really lesson plans for general education teachers and special education teachers uh, to teach uh, you know 40 to 50 minute class periods, and they can be flexibly administered o o over uh, uh, over a semester or throughout a school year, depending on how you'd like to do it. Um, very briefly, I wanted to mention the theory that I really think helps us as clinicians. I think it helps family members. I think it helps the depressed and suicidal teenagers. I know for sure it's helped many school personnel change their attitude about dealing with depressed and suicidal youth through the biosocial theory that Marshall Linehan developed. And basically, while it started as a theory of borderline personality disorder, it's really a theory of emotional dysregulation. And I think it, it's not, so I want to broaden this beyond this notion of BPD, because many depressed and suicidal teens who also struggle with some of the other problems we talked about earlier, there, there may be a true biological-based dysfunction in the emotion regulation system, meaning they, are, they may be more prone to depression, more prone to emotional sensitivity and reactivity potentially, uh, and sometimes a slower return to emotional baseline. And then their environments, whether it be family environments, school environments, peers, over time they, they, they feel that the environment doesn't get them. They feel uh, that they're not, they don't feel accepted or understood. And that worsens their emotional vulnerability, just as the environment feels frustrated that they can't better keep calm the individual down who's suicidal, get, get the teenager who's depressed to be less depressed and more behaviorally activated. So over time, the environment can exacerbate the individual's biology, just as the individual's vulnerability sometimes exacerbate the environment. One of the, 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 the interesting things about DBT, like I said earlier, is balancing problem solving with, with validation is really the core of the treatment. But a lot of times, when working with depressed and suicidal youth in outpatient settings in schools, I feel like, as professionals, we err too much on the environmental intervention side, meaning we do for the teenager when they're feeling this way. Can you do that? Can you help me write my, my report? Can you speak to my mom for me? Can you, you know, this is not just for mental health professionals, this is for anyone in the environment. And, and both we're caring health professionals, we're caring family members, and we do for them. Which unfortunately, and while there's a place for that, I sometimes think we reinforce passivity. We communicate to the, the depressed and suicidal youth that they're an invalid they can't do for themselves. And so from a DBT perspective, the idea here is can we consult to the individual, the patient, the adolescent, on how to more effectively navigate their life problems rather than do for them. And that is on the change side of the seesaw, if you will. And how do we as clinicians and family members and school personnel find that balance? Uh, and certainly working in outpatient settings, in, 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 in inner city and in hospital settings, I've seen a host of patients become chronic mental patients because they have relied heavily on the system to take care of their problems and never been challenged to have to do for themselves. So how do we engage the depressed and suicidal youth in working hard on, the, on these aspects of things for themselves? I, I like this, uh, the slides from the Dalai Lama and this quote, rather, it says, when educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. So I really feel strongly when working in school settings, we have to bring in the emotional piece. So I know I, I kind of raced through. I'm trying to stick with my 35-minute time frame. 
And I certainly want to um, ask if there are um, questions, and I'm happy to answer them. All right, I would encourage everybody to type in your questions. Looks like nobody has typed in so far, so do go ahead. If you have any questions, do type it into the Q&A panel. Please type in your question. Was I so speedy that I overwhelmed people? I hope not. <laughs> OK, so oh yeah, the questions are coming in. Oh, so we have a question here. How critical is the involvement of the parents? Well, critical is an interesting word. I, I think it's advantageous to have family involvement. I, I think um, especially when there's high levels of conflict in the household, um, and, and, the D, and the therapist can sometimes recognize that when they're doing a behavioral chain analysis and discovering that the teenager is saying, you know, I'm feeling ashamed or humiliated or I feel badly in the fights that I'm having with my family and it makes me think about hurting myself. That's a no-brainer, and we, after this, the teenager is learning some skills and tools, and hopefully the parents maybe too, we want to bring them in to do some family work. Um, there are other cases, older adolescents, uh, for whom the family relationship is not a source of conflict, where it's not critical, but I still think it's advantageous, because when you're depressed, you're feeling pretty much uh, often alone and lacking social supports, so as much as the family can can kind of understand from a psychoeducational perspective what this depression is like, how to bolster the, the young person's uh, emotional you know, support for them, and, and sometimes it is involving getting them activated with their uh, family members and doing some shared activities. I think it's highly advantageous. All right. Uh, we have another question here which I think is very, very relevant. I have, uh, the person says, I have a son who is 22 years old with depression, with suicidal thoughts. He told me about it, that's what the parent has said, but I don't know how I can help. Mm, okay. Well, I think uh, I would say, first of all, to the parent that I think it would be really helpful to let the young person know that you appreciate them trusting you and confiding in you about their emotional pain and that you hear that they've been suffering. If they're depressed and having suicidal thoughts, they're clearly having some emotional pain. And um, then the next question is, can we, uh, I don't know, how, you know, ask whether they want to talk to you a little bit about it. How long has this been going on for? How, how uh, you know, how uh, serious are these suicidal thoughts? If it's, if it's kind of passing thoughts that come up every so often, it's not quite a level of emergency, but if they're, if they're having, you know, urgent, imminent thoughts, like I want to die and I've had thoughts about how I would do it um, this week, that means we're, you know, at, at an emergent level, and I'd love to have your son evaluated as soon as possible by a mental health professional to see uh, how, how at risk this individual is. Hopefully it's not that acute, and you might be able to set up um, – uh, an outpatient visit with a, uh, a psychologist who has expertise in CBT or DBT uh, to, do, to do such an evaluation. Um, but if, if, if he is saying that it's very acute and he's thinking you know, about imminently killing himself, I would, I would urge you to urge him to go, you know, in the short term, to go to a local emergency room and have him, have him evaluated to make sure he doesn't do any uh, major harm to himself. <clears throat> Is that, does that answer that question? Um, so there is another question here. <coughs> it is also a parent. Oh, yes, she has responded and said yes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so here is another parent who has asked, how do you coach a parent to be validating when the teen seems to resist this? My teen gets angry when I try to validate him and angrier if I try to offer a hopeful perspective mm. when they are seeing things as altogether horrible. Yeah. It's a really great question, and I think a lot of us, uh, you know, at first blush, validation sounds easy because you want to just let them know, I hear you, I, you know, and the, the kind of typical mistakes some parents make is they, they um, 
you know, do a, a simple, like, I understand your pain, I've been there before, you know, I was a teenager too, and in some ways that seems invalidating the teenager as opposed to asking with some curiosity and compassion, tell me what's going on. You know, I can see you're upset, but I, I'd love to understand what's, what, what's going on with you. And kind of inviting a dialogue without presuming that you know more than you do about what it is that's distressing to them. Um, and, and if they don't want to talk at the moment, you can say, I, I can tell you're upset. And if you don't want to talk right now, that's okay, but I want you to know I'm here at, at any time. Uh, you know, I, I love, I, I, I'm available to speak with you if you're feeling uh, upset about things. Um, a lot of parents sometimes, uh, I think, are wary of validation because they think of it as more like reinforcement. So, you know, if a, a child comes home and, and a, after a late night out teenager and fails their chemistry test and is crying at the table, sometimes the parents don't want to, quote, unquote, validate that because it's like condoning uh, behavior uh, out all night with their friends or whatever, uh, maladaptive behavior. But I still think you can say that I can see or I can tell that you're really upset about failing your chemistry test. That's got to be a really painful. And really hold on to the notion of, but, you know, if you just went to bed earlier and, or studied more, you would have done great, right? Because I think that's where we undo our efforts of acknowledging their pain by coming in with, but you should have done this, or if you just had done that, and all of our parental, quote, unquote, wisdom sometimes undoes so when in doubt, I love for parents to try to acknowledge the pain if you can see it or hear it. And if you're not sure what's going on, to ask with this curious compassion, I can see you're upset and troubled by something. I just, I really would love to understand what's going on, and I'm here to talk to you if you'd like to share. And be open and inviting without putting on undue pressure. Right. Um... There is another question here. I think it's from a therapist. She has said, I have a client who experiences suicidal ideation but does not make any plans, leaves the classroom many times a day. I'm doing CBT and ACT with her. Should I refer her to a DBT therapist instead? She was doing better but has slipped back since school has started. So it sounds like there's kind of ongoing suicidal, passive suicidal thinking meaning that there's no active plan, but that it's still kind of, it got a little bit better, and now as school has started, it, it has kind of uh, resurfaced. I, I, I don't want to rush to uh, refer out if, if there's a good relationship and there's been progress. I guess I just want to encourage the therapist to kind of assess, you know, what, what are the triggers that exacerbate the increase in passive suicidal thinking? Is it something about anxiety around school, is there some peer, peer issues in the school context, um, and maybe really trying to intervene on the antecedents that, uh, that come before the uh, emotional, the, come before the suicidal thinking, and what emotions are, 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 are being experienced that might precede that as well. So kind of look at those things, and, and is there relief? It, it sounds bizarre, but for some people, like I said, there may be some relief from negative emotions by having even suicidal thoughts. Uh, and to help the, the young person understand the relationship, if, if that's true, and then go back and target those emotional states that, that they're trying to escape from, if that's what's going on. If all that fails and, and things are worsening and there's more serious things, thoughts about suicide, um, it, you know, it, it may be time if you've exhausted all other uh, CBT and AC, ACT treatment strategies to consider uh, a DBT referral, but I, I, again, I, 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 I really feel that the relationship, if it's strong and there are still ways of uh, assessing intervening, I, I'll hold off on transferring the client. Right. Uh, we have another counselor. She says she's working in a college counseling center, and she says the in-between check-ins are not possible via phone. And she's asked, what else do you suggest to prevent the self-injurious behaviors? Well, uh, yeah, th th I appreciate that question because certainly uh, in an ideal world, if you're doing DBT, you, you have, uh, and even, if, even outside of DBT, there are a lot of other theoretical approaches um, that uh, encourage people to make themselves available when you have a suicidal or self-injurious client uh, outside a session. But some 
treatment settings don't allow for that in school settings. So in those situations, uh, I, I like to have a coping ahead plan so that the counselor can meet with the, the student or client uh, at the next session and review a variety of distress tolerance skills, if you will, and, uh, and, and, and write them down and kind of be clear what specifically uh, the distress, which specific distress tolerance skills he or she are, is willing to try, get some commitment to use it, and, you know, create certain prompts or reminders in the, in the teenager's environment, whether it be at school or at home, as to refer to that crisis uh, plan, if you will, and, and, and come up and, and review it. And so in some ways, I might have the teenager at the next session bring in, once we've agreed upon it, what are the, whether it be, you know, his, his or her iPod or, uh, and listening to music, whether it be for some who are tactile, some kind of, silly putty or, or literally Play-Doh to soothe. Some, for some it is, um, you know, putting on certain lotions. For some it is using a Sudoku uh, a puzzle or, or, you know, a, a word search uh, to kind of when in distress to distract or self-soothe, even for five or ten minutes. Now some people poo-poo this idea, well, how is putting on lotion or listening to music really going to reduce suicidality? And it's not, you know, I think for some, these suicidal episodes don't last necessarily for days. Sometimes it can be an acute crisis for 20 minutes or an hour, and if we can kind of distract and self-soothe and string some of these various ideas together, including really cold water on one's face, it's called the tip skills, uh, that uh, active, activates the, uh, the dive reflex, if you will, and kind of brings down the, 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 the parasympathetic nervous system, or, you know, um, a variety of pace breathing exercises, if we can string some of these together, uh, they might be able to bring down their distress and may not need active coaching. But a lot of it would mean require some preparation in the, in the individual sessions and a clear plan on what he or she is going to try. And if that doesn't work, what can you try next? And if that doesn't work, what can you try next? Here's another question. Um... She's asked how to engage an adolescent who is not engaged in trying the skills and has expressed a desire to not even experiment with the skills. Mm. Yeah, good question. I, I think for those youth, um, it goes back to this notion in DVT terms of called pre-treatment, which is we're going back to what are we, what, what are we here for, what are your goals um, in life, if you will, and how does this therapy help or not help you get there. And maybe I wasn't clear in terms of how I visualize these skills being useful to you. If your goal is to reduce your depression, if your goal is to not kill yourself, if your goal is to improve your relationships at home, if those are your goals, I have a sense that what you've been doing thus far seems not to be as effective based on what you told me. So are you willing to consider trying something? If you're saying all of these skills, these 33 skills that I've mentioned to you, are you're not willing to experiment with, then I, I need to understand why is that? But you say you have these goals, and yet you're unwilling to try anything that I've suggested as an as a alternative replacement. What What is that? And maybe I don't understand what is the function of that, the refusal, you know? Is it fear of failing as a, DB, as, a as a client? Is it... Is it um, you know, fear of being judged by the therapist? I, I don't know. But let me better understand what the thinking process is by that adolescent who's saying, I will not. And, and at some point, if after a few visits, he or she is just unwilling, digging his heels in and saying, I refuse, this is not the therapy for me, then I can say, hey, this therapy may not be for you. This is for people who want to build a life worth living, who want to stay alive and reduce their depression. So if that's not what you're interested in or if, if, if doing behavioral skills and learning new things is not your thing and you just want to have insight or something and not practice things, this may not be the right modality for you and let's, let's figure out some other treatment that might be more preferable because at a certain point it's going to be wasting a lot of time and, and, and potentially money for this young person and, and time is of the essence and I don't want to have a, a year go by where we're just spinning our wheels. <clears throat> Right. Um, one of the attendees um, would like a little more information about mindfulness strategies. 
Yeah. He's asked, is it similar to being empathetic while working with at-risk youth? Yeah, well, uh, certainly we want, there's mindfulness on behalf of the clinician and therapist, but in, in the DBT model, we're helping our teenagers and, their, and potentially their family members learn a host of what and how skills. In other words, how can they access their wise mind? Because a lot of what they do when they're hurting themselves or avoiding life or school or avoiding the social party because they feel so miserable is emotion mind decision making. In other words, they're getting emotionally hijacked and then rationalizing that this is the effective thing to do in the moment. And we need to teach our teens how to access their wise mind. And how they do that is through these six behavioral skills, which include how do you observe in the moment, it, it almost pre-verbally, what is my experiencing? Experience, like I'm noticing my, you know, this quote unquote butterflies in my stomach. I'm noticing having thoughts that I stink, that I'm terrible. I'm having the thought that. Now this meta-awareness of separating what I think as a fact, like I suck versus I have the thought that I suck, is a very important distinction. Being able to be able to operationalize, I'm having thoughts that, I'm having feelings that, I'm noticing the urge to do X, Y, or Z is very different than just doing it or just saying this is a fact. So observing and describing one's ex internal experience in real time in a non-judgmental way is huge. That's part one, and part, you know, that's the awareness piece. It slows everything down, and if I drew an X and Y axis and I showed uh, teen suicidal teenagers' impulsive urge going from zero to 100, if we could slow this down and say, I'm starting to have thoughts about hurting myself, I'm starting to feel really badly about myself. That buys us time to then make more wise-minded decisions about what to do. So that's the awareness. And then the other part of this is so much of the suffering is being hijacked and how to notice yourself, your brain going off the present moment. Think about it as a, you know, those old camera lenses, the uh, ca cameras you see on the TV show, and, it, and the, the lens being taken off the subject and, and then gently nudging it back and trying to stay focused and be effective in this moment is so huge so you can participate more fully and not be laden with the misery and intense pain that depression brings to us. So I think that, that, is, that is a huge part of teaching mindfulness to our youth. Okay. <clears throat> Another question is um, about um, distress tolerance and emotion regulation, how are they different? Are they similar? Yeah. Um, distress tolerance is really if, if your pain, emotional pain or, or urges, if you if the scale is 0 to 100, if you're going 70 or, or 80 and real high and you're having impulses to kill yourself or hurt yourself, in that moment it's very hard to go necessarily right after the emotion per se in the beginning of treatment when you don't have a lot of emotion regulation capabilities. It is easier in the short term in the beginning of treatment to say I'm having urges to, to, to overdose or to hurt, cut myself. What can I do instead to just buy myself some time so I don't make my problem worse? It's kind of like if I fell overboard off of, off of a cruise ship and I, have, I, I get submerged and then I come back up and I see my boat is is, is is cruising away. Of course, the urge is to scream for help and wave and wave and wave or even try to swim after the boat. The problem with that is, in an effort to solve my crisis, what could happen? I could drown because acting on that impulse to help myself even or you know solve my problem could actually kill me, if you will. In the same vein, I, I need to be mindful enough to know that if I act impulsively like this, it's a real problem. So what can I do to calm myself down, and if I fell overboard, I need to calm my breathing, I need to do a survival float and wait for the other boat, a, a different boat, you know, a mile away who's heading toward my direction to hopefully get me, but I can't panic and react that way. So, th so there's distress tolerance, which is crisis survival is a big piece of it. The other part of distress tolerance is, is working on radically accepting some of the life things that have happened that we can't change, as I mentioned earlier. But the emotion regulation skills 
we ultimately want to use a lot more of once we kind of acquire a little more capability to tolerate distress and buying ourselves time is how do you observe and describe emotions for kids? They need help with that. How do you, how do you increase positive emotions? Like, you know, so we teach them, you know, putting pennies in the piggy bank, will accumulating positives will help them feel less depressed. Engaging in pleasurable activities and noticing them and being mindful of them is huge. Doing things called building mastery is an emotion regulation skill. It's not always pleasurable to do your homework or it's not always pleasurable to, uh, uh, you know, save money in the moment, but it does give you a sense of mastery and efficacy. That's huge, right? Uh, so there's a, there's a uh, again, I could go on and on with another uh, 15 emotion regulation skills, but the difference a lot is kind of that is kind of a, um, a accumulating effect and distress tolerance uh, in, in a shorthand version is more of just crisis survival. How do I get through this one moment? Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So we have another therapist who has asked, do you feel an individual therapist in private practice can work on DBT curriculum in individual format only? What differences are there and how to uh, make that work? Uh, so can you just clarify, say that one more time, please? Uh, she's asked if an individual therapist in private practice can work on DBT in individual yeah. format only without the group format, right. and what differences are there and uh, how to improve that work. Right. So it, for, for the depressed and suicidal youth and multi-problem youth that I've referenced tonight, I, I would argue against an individual therapist doing all of the modes of treatment by themselves. That means doing the individual therapy, the skills training, the coaching. Uh, it's, it, this, this treatment was built for a team of clinicians working with a community of, of clients. And so it, it's, it's a very uh, challenging population, as we all know, and, and I think uh, DBT was never intended to be done by a single individual for the, for the clientele that it started with. If you have some, uh, a, you know, maybe depressed only or, you know, uh, less severely behaviorally dysregulated clients, I think you could weave in some DBT skills. But once you cross the threshold and you have both intense emotional dysregulation, i.e., severe depression, anxiety, anger discontrol, and so forth, coupled with significant behavioral dysregulation, I would argue you need to do the comprehensive DBT model as it was prescribed originally by Linehan and by myself and Jill Rathis with adolescents. Um, and that means multiple clinicians, somebody doing the individual therapy and a different person doing skills training. And in all fairness, I, many years when I first learned this, I tried that at home to do it myself and it was a colossal disaster because as I tried to teach skills to my client on a given session, you know, I realized there were a lot of life problems coming in that I got, I, I got hijacked, if you will, with, the, with, the, with my patient to talk about whatever acute thing happened. But if you're running a skills group, well, there's no individual therapy going on. It's teaching. My job is like the U.S. Postal Service. I'm going to teach these skills, and that's all my job is for the next two hours. And then you, if you have a problem, go talk to your individual therapist about it, you know, outside of here. So di dividing those roles, I think, is critical. All right. So I think uh, we have come to the end of our hour. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for an excellent webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions. I apologize for that. We hope this was helpful. Please let others know about this series and consider making a contribution to ADAA. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.